All right, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and get started so we can get out of here and try to beat whatever weather is on its way. I was trying to wait on my husband and my son, but they had a flat tire. I know. So, you know, he's dealing with that and his precious Ram 1500. That means everything to him. So. <laughs> So uh, as long as they're safe, though, I'm good. So I'm going to start, and then when they get here, I'll, I'll introduce them and let them wave at everybody. Um, so first, let me say thank you um, for enduring the weather, first of all, and coming out to our town hall meeting. We have a really packed agenda today. I'm excited to get all the updates out to you. Um, I did receive a couple of emails that some folks weren't going to make it, and they asked for uh, me to make the presentation available and some of the supplemental documents. So I will do that. I will post it and I will send an email out to everyone with the links in it. Um, so don't, don't be worried about not being able to capture everything you hear today. I am going to send out the presentation, so no worries on that end. Okay. So before we get into the standard agenda, um, I know I, I need to make a statement about um, some of the things that's happened over the last few weeks. Um, so I'm going to make a very short one. Okay. Uh, first, I want to say that I appreciate everyone who's reached out to me and my family over the last few weeks with a lot of words of encouragement and support. Uh, we really, really appreciated that. Um, I want you to know, though, that my family and I take very seriously this role of representing District 3 in the city of Stonecrest. Um, and with that role, there are many of sacrifices that myself and my family have to make so that I can represent our district and put my gifts, talents, and experiences to better our community. So I do work a full-time job, and my full-time job requires me to travel every now and then. But that does not mean that I have abandoned my role or my district. Everything that I do and my family does is so that we can balance as much as we can to provide our community with everything we think it deserves. I just wanted to make sure to let you all know that I truly appreciate you. I look forward every day to representing Stonecrest in District 3, and by no circumstances have I abandoned my role or not take seriously what my family and I sacrifice every day so that we can do what we think is best for our city of Stonecrest. So with that said, <laughs> we're going to move into the full agenda today. Uh, but again, I want you to know I really appreciate your continued support. Thank you. So we have a packed agenda. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, code enforcement. We're going to go through some SPLOST. We're going to go through parks and recs. We're going to go through our transportation master plan. We're going to go through some census. Um, so we've got a lot to cover tonight. Um, but all of it is, is worth it for sure. Um, and we're going to actually kick it off with our special guest, um, who are here from DeKalb County. We have a new voting machine, if you haven't heard. <laughs> um, so they're here. We're going to make a, a demonstration. We're going to do a quick walkthrough, um, a just general walkthrough. And then at your leisure, feel free to kind of sneak up here and, and get a one-on-one -on, -one on how to use the machine. Um, we know that we have an election right around the corner in March. So we want to make sure that, that Stonecrest um, has played its role in making sure that everybody has an opportunity to touch the machine and get familiar with it. Um, so right before we start that, quickly I just want to go over um, our meeting schedule. So the council meets every second and fourth Monday right here where you're sitting um, e of each month. Um, and then our planning commission meets on the first Tuesday of each month. Our zoning board meets on the third Tuesday of each month. And then we in District 3 try to meet quarterly. Um, and, and last meeting we had... Um, we were here at City Hall as a kind of a last minute change to location. Um, but because we had the technology that we have here, we're able to video record the meeting and then I can upload that and make sure everyone gets it. It's, it's kind of difficult to find that kind of technology at no cost. <laughs> um, so I decided that we probably keep it here um, just so we have visibility, accessibility and that technological advances that make it easier for folks who can't attend. So we'll probably just we'll keep it here. So don't be mad because we're not in District 3. Um, it's just because we have some good technology here. 
So again, we're going to start with our special guest. So if you will, please, um, we're going to do a, a demonstration really quickly. Um, and like I said, in, in between, feel free to come up on your own and take a look at the machine. Um, and then we'll move on with the agenda while you're doing that. So this is the only microphone. So you can... Greetings. I am Natia from the DeKalb County Voter Registration and Elections Office. Uh, I have with me Miss Deanna, Miss Jasmine, and Miss Toy. And we are going to do a brief walkthrough of the new voting process. So, when you walked into your polling place, how many people remember filling out the certificate? Right, everybody in the room should remember that certificate. So there's no longer a community meeting right there at that table filling out that certificate. <laughs> you now have that first station, that certificate station, as well as where they created your yellow voter access card. Those two stations have now been combined. It is called the check-in station. So you'll walk into your polling place, they'll ask you for uh, your government issued photo ID. If it happens to be the driver's license, there's a barcode on the back that we are able to scan and it will bring up your information. Once they verify you are who you say you are, that poll official will then actually turn that poll pad around to you and give you control over the poll pad so that you can not only mark your party preference, but as well as sign your oath. So just like you signed that certificate to sign your oath, you still have to sign your oath. There is an added option on the poll pad that gives our uh, visually impaired the option to listen to their oath as well. There is also, if you bring someone uh, that has a disability or an elderly, you may bring your parents to the polling precinct. We have a lot of um, mother-daughter teams that come in and father-son teams that come in and they want to assist their mother or their father with their voting process. They have to still sign an oath saying that they're not gonna try and persuade their vote to go either way. Okay, so that option is also on that poll pad. So everything that you would normally do at that first and second station is now on one station. So once they verify you are who you say you are, you've made your party selection, and you've signed your oath, they will then continue on and create you a green voter card. It is now a green card. It's not the access card. It's just a voter card. You'll take it to one of the voting booths. And you'll actually slide it in at a slight angle downward, and it's not going to click into the machine anymore. It's just going to sit about halfway in. You'll know that it's ready and it's in securely because you'll have some instructions on the screen. Uh, same options that we had to enlarge the text are still there. You can also still change the contrast of the screen. They have actually added uh, the white, excuse me, the white on black um, option instead of just black and white or color. Uh, another cool feature about our new tablets is that you can actually access the questions on the ballot from the top of the screen by just touching the tabs, or you, of course you can go through the full ballot by touching the next button at the bottom. Uh, our tablets now give you warnings. So if you accidentally skip a question, once you get to your review screen, it'll say, hey, your ballot is valid, however you have warnings. So whether you leave something undervoted, because we know sometimes we have to pick more than just one person for the same seat, so it'll let you know, hey, you undervoted, but of course it's our voice, it's our vote, so you don't have to answer anything that you don't want to, and you don't have to vote for both seats if necessary. You just vote how you please. They're just letting you know, hey, you got a warning. So now instead of casting your ballot on those machines, you are actually just printing your ballot. You are only marking your ballot at this voting booth. So it'll ask you to print your ballot, and then it will ask you again, hey, do you, are you sure? Do you need to review it again? Or do you want to go ahead and print? If you want to go ahead and print, you will print your ballot. Your, at, your voter card, your green voter card, will no longer eject out of the machine. You'll actually have to pull it out of the machine, as well as pull your paper off of the printer. Once your paper comes out of the printer completely, you will see the question as well as the choice that you made. That is your third opportunity to review that ballot. However, no fret. Say you're reviewing that paper ballot and you're standing there and you're like, hey, I didn't mean to miss that question. That is quite all right. You will ask for assistance from one of our poll officials. They will kindly escort you back to the check-in station. No, you do not have to get back in the line. They'll take you to the front of the line, allow you to um, spoil the paper ballot and recreate the card. Because at these voting machines, you are only marking your ballot. You're putting pencil to paper. That is all. After you are, if you are happy with your, pa your printed paper ballot, that's a tongue twister. 
<laughs> your printed paper ballot, you will then be escorted to the casting station, which is a scanner. This scanner takes a tally of the election results. It takes a PDF picture of your paper ballot, and it also drops the paper ballot in the bottom of the can. So there are three uh, functions for that, uh, that that scanner offers, and all you have to do is slide the paper in, whether it's face up or face down. You will see buttons there. Don't be tempted to push the buttons because you don't have to. You just slide it in. It will tell you that it is processing your ballot, it is casting your ballot, and then it will say successfully cast. And after that, you take your green card and you do that even exchange for what? Your peach sticker. <laughs> and that is the new voting process. It um, sounds simple enough, and I would definitely love for everyone to be able to come up and actually use the machines, get a feel for it. It's just like an overgrown iPad. A huge iPad. It's a big tele. It's a touch TV. That's what I like. So you touch it. If you make a choice on the tablet, if you want to remove it, you just touch it again. And if you leave it blank again, it'll tell you. It'll give you warnings on each question as well as at the end of your ballot when you're on your review screen. And sure. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. After you've printed the ballot, you can go back to that station as many times as it takes you. Mm -hmm. We were hearing that at first, but then later on we had gotten some new information and we were told that you can actually go back as many times as you need. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I believe it will be a little faster. Um, I think the, the longest part would probably either be you standing at the booth, you know, because people stand there and to make their decision, they kind of think about it first. Of course, we do have these sample ballots that you are more than welcome to take into the precinct with you. That way you can just go through your ballot. But not everyone does that. Um, the next longest line that I think would be would be the scanner because at that point you're just waiting to scan it in. But everything moves pretty quickly. The printers, they print pretty fast. The scanner takes the paper pretty fast. That process maybe takes about three or four seconds. I actually think it will be a lot smoother after this first election. It should move. It's, it's new for everyone. And so, of course, anything that's new, we have to get a feel for it first. But I think it's, I think it's a quicker process. Yes. That information is located on the Secretary of State website. However, I do know that Carroll County uh, used them back in November, and I know that from grandmother. Because I told her to go out and, and to see the new voting process, and she said, well, baby, I've already done it. And I was like, okay, well, thanks, Grandma. <laughs> So I do know Carroll County has uh, actually tested them back in November. As far as the results and how they liked it, my grandmother, she loved it. It was, she said it was fast, it was simple, and, and, and she loved it. Um, but any other questions, I believe you should be able to find that information on the Secretary of State. Each precinct is determined by the number of uh, registered voters in that precinct. No, it's based off of the number of registered voters. Mm -hmm. Yes. They're available to assist should that machine jam while folks yes. are trying to. Yes, there are. There used to be five to six poll workers in each precinct. There is now eleven to twelve poll workers in each precinct. Um, there will be two monitors, not only walking around to assist with anyone who hasn't seen the demonstration, to assist them with operating the tablet. There will also be monitors standing at the scanner all day. That scanner has about eight seals on it, and they are there. I I mean, they're. I'm not sure if they're going to have one or two people on the scanner, but there will be someone at that scanner all day. Okay. 
there a backup scanner in every precinct? There is a manual slot on the scanner. So if the front part goes down, there is a manual slot that you can drop that you cast your ballot in. If the, if the scanner goes down and they manually in, insert their ballot, yes, at the end of the evening, the manager's responsibility is to make sure that all of those ballots have gone through the scanner. Even if that means bringing out another scanner to, to the precinct if they're not able to get it back up. That question, I, I'm, I honestly, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they're if they're trained on the back on the backup plan, but they're everyone's going through an eight hour training. Some of them are taking two and three classes. The managers have to take three classes. Two of them are eight hours, and the assistant managers have to take two. One is an eight hour class. So I'm I'm sure they are covering that in uh, in their training class. So ladies will be here. Do you have any more questions? Well, I kind of take a side and walk over, and, and they're this is where they can ask any question you want. Um, yeah. Feel free to walk over. Go on ahead. Um, you are confident how to use that machine, whether it's feel free to go over. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate you ladies coming out and doing that for us. Um, so I believe that um, DeKalb County has on their website, um, and I think I posted it one time too, and I'll post it again, where there are more demonstrations throughout the county before um, the next election. So please, um, if you don't feel like you want to do it today, but you want to take some time another day, please look at that calendar, find another date they're going to do a demonstration, and try to get there before the election. Awesome. It's on all of their social media. Yeah, so info is out there. Thank you again, ladies. So our next guest, um, who are not really guests, <laughs> they kind of live here um, Monday through Friday and sometimes on Saturday. Um, we're going to have our code enforcement officers come up um, and give us some updates on code enforcement. So I asked them to, when they're doing their presentation um, to hone in on District 3. So I'm sure there's a little bit of both, um, citywide and District 3. Um, but this is our officer, Al Farrell, and then uh, who is the director of code enforcement and then we have our friend Jacob uh, who is our uh, code enforcement huh oh yeah he's our district 3 code enforcement officer it's district 3 let me pull your PowerPoint up Thank you, Councilwoman Cobble. Um, again, I'm Alejandro Farrell. I'm the Director of Code Enforcement for the City of Stonecrest. And this is Jacob Cockrell. He is the Code Enforcement Officer assigned to each to District 3. Um, as she stated, we, uh, Councilwoman Cobble and I rode out probably, what, about two weeks ago, kind of ride her district just to see what her thoughts are and, and concerns. Um, we made several observations. Many of you probably know what those observations are. And so briefly, we're going to just go through that real quickly. Um, you know, our goal is to, to address the property concerns throughout the city. Um, code enforcement is designed to maintain the property values, as many of you know, for every property um, within commercial and residential areas. So that's kind of what our focus is. Uh, and some of you this have, may have seen this. And, and with respect to a code enforcement program, it's designed to one, create a quality of life for everyone. Um, as I explained to a resident yesterday, noise is a quality of life issue. Trash, which the bulk of what we see, um, as Jacob can attest, and other elected officials, uh, the deputy city manager, and I receive emails 
throughout the week in days of, of trash, and that's probably one of our biggest issues throughout the city, especially District 3. Um, and we'll give you a few updates on some of the things that Jacob and I have been working on in the last couple of weeks as well. And then the goal of, again, the code enforcement program is to make and keep the city of Stonecrest clean and beautiful uh, place. Um, ultimately, it takes everyone. It takes all of us working together in unison to do that. It takes education, it takes patience, it takes also understanding on both sides. Some things we wish we could resolve immediately, but we know in some cases everything has a due process. Um, we, you know, we understand people's Fourth Amendment rights, so we have to respect that. So just because you don't see everything changing overnight, it's not, uh, it doesn't mean it's not working. Just like I tell people, uh, you know, police officers, when they're going out to investigate a crime, sometimes you don't see them doing the undercover stuff, the behind the scenes stuff, but the crime still is there, but you're like, they're not doing it. I promise you they're doing something. Same thing with us. Um, we're, we're not police officers, but we have to research. We have to look at our zoning ordinance. We have to see if the violation exists. If it's, you know, sometimes we have to, to go out to our, with our city attorney in some cases and, and sit there and say, hey, this is what we have. This is where we're at. You know, what's the next step if needed? Um, so that's what we're trying to do. Um, again, some of our duties, we deal with everything from business license complaints, um, parking in your yard, outside storage, trash, debris, vacant houses, legal businesses um, from massage parlors to party houses. We're kind of a catch-all. Um, so a lot of times we, we wear many hats. Uh, we do some public work stuff on the side. <laughs> Uh, we do, we help out Parks and Rec, you know, in some capacity and vice versa. Uh, so we do a little bit of everything. So just bear with us. Um, we, we, we work partner well with the police department here in the city. I'm um, dealing with illegal vehicles or, or uh, inoperable vehicles on the street, which the city doesn't tow, but I have to refer them if they do come into my office or we do see them driving around, we refer them over to the CAP PD because they have to go through their process since the CAB PD handles everything on the legal roadway because of state law, they're required to go through that process of towing. Um, we handle everything on private property. So that comes back to those things on private property. We handle those type of issues. Um, so if it's in your driveway, doesn't have a current tag or insurance, then it's an inoperable vehicle by our, our standards, which we would address. Um, the process ultimately boils down to you call our call center 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I get an email as soon as you hang up the phone with your information if you so desire, what your concern is, where the property is. If you want to be anonymous, you can do so at that time, and that's fine as well. But the number there is 770-224-0200. Um, again, it's available 365 days a year. Um, and at that point, I receive an email if I'm up and Councilwoman Cobb was emailing me last night like at 11 o'clock and I was responding to her, you know, related to this, to this and some other issues. So, and Councilman Turner can attest, you know, sometimes I, you know, I probably do a lot of that, but I'm one of those, I would really answer the question then and move on to the next piece. Um, so my staff knows that as well. Uh, but I will respond either that we're looking into it or we're addressing it or whatever I know as soon as I receive that email. And in most cases, we refer it over to my officers, officers that assign each area. At that point, and, and Jacob is one of, you know, one of my, one of the best officers I have. Um, he usually, he's usually out there probably within the same day, if, if not within, you know, 24 hours. And he's, you know, as a matter of fact, Councilwoman Cobble emailed us at about 5.30. Yeah. And, he, and he's like, I'm still here. I'll go out here and take a look at it. And he addressed it. You know, that's just the type of staff that we have holistically. You know, the goal is clients. Um, we do not like to, to write tickets. Do we? Yes. Um, is it, it's more costly for us to write tickets, honestly. From time to process, it is really honestly. But we do. Um, so... Once that, that process happens, the officer goes out, he or she actually identifies the violation or violations. Um, what we try to do is do a holistic approach of the area. So if we come to your house, 
we're going to look at surrounding houses for any code violations because we don't want to be classified as being, um, you know, preferential treatment or, 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 or singling someone out. Um, so I get a lot of those calls. Those are usually my complaint calls. Last week I had someone call that I'm singled out because I got a notice about the jump cars in another district. It was actually Councilwoman Grimes' district. <laughs> and so the lady called and complained. And so what I do, because we have a system, a software system, I went in, I called the officer, I said, hey, what area is this, you know, this person in or what have you? And they gave me all the street addresses. And I pulled up probably 15 houses that the person, that my officer went in, literally in one neighborhood. So this is how severe the issues that we had. They were all junk car cases in one neighborhood on like four different houses, four different streets in the neighborhood. It wasn't even the whole neighborhood, it was just like a portion of the neighborhood. So 15 houses. So let's just say there's 100 houses in the neighborhood. That's a lot. And there were flat tire, car in the drive with expired tags, you know, wrecked. And so when I told her that, she was like, okay, well, I see that y'all are not picking it. I said, ma'am, I promise you, there's 53,000 people. I couldn't tell you what kind of car you have in your driveway or anything. I said, we are too busy for that. We have to represent everybody. So our goal is to try to do that. At that point, again, as I was stating, the officer will give you the notice. It is a notice. It says notice of violation at the top. It is not a citation. <laughs> so don't take it as such. Where I reside at, I have received a notice several years ago from our code enforcement because my grass wasn't cut. I was on vacation. It had rained. At first, I was a little offended, but then I said, you know what? It's not a big deal. I called them back and said, hey, look, I was out of town. Grass is cut. Here's a picture. And that was it. Called the officer back. He said, okay, fine. Thank you. No problem. He said, I just was in the neighborhood. I have 400 houses in my neighborhood. So he's like, I was in the neighborhood, responded to a complaint, saw that your grass needed to be cut. I said, okay, I get it, no big deal. And we moved on. So that's all it is, it's a notice. It's saying, hey, did you know what the code section says about this violation? There are so many city ordinances and police officers back here who tell you there's so many state and county ordinances, you can't know them off the top of your head, but we probably know the main ones, you know, the, the common ones. So, so at that point, you get a notice, you have seven days to comply, reach back to the officer if something, you know, is, is warranting a, a extension. We will grant an extension, usually up to 30 days. Um, I usually advise them to let me know just to kind of see where we're at um, with it. But it is their discretion at that point to, to grant the extension. Um, and at that point, if they need to issue a citation, it is their disc discretion as well. Um, you know, we may talk about it just to see if we can get it to a resolution fairly quick. But ultimately, the citation piece is the last phase. We don't necessarily have to see you personally to cite you. If we know who the property owner is or the residents, we can actually post that citation on your door, any dwelling that you reside at. Um, we do travel. So where'd you go last time? Yeah, he went to Douglasville to cite somebody. I said, go get him. And he pulled up and the guy was looking, how'd you find me? But he, but he had a house that was in disrepair here. But when we went to his house, Got a pool in the backyard or in the neighborhood, you know, and I'm like, nah, man, you're not going to do us like that. And that's, so those are the things we do. Some things we have to do, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. We have to research people. He cited someone last week or a couple weeks ago. The guy was in New York. And he called, I called him last Tuesday or a Friday before last. You have court next Tuesday. He showed up in court. He didn't like the response. So now he's getting an attorney. But. You know, the issue is he has a tenant residing in a house with no heat for the last month and a half. And he won't fix the furnace. I talked to his uh, maintenance person personally, and the guy was like, look, I just need a, he just needed to approve a furnace. And we're good to go. So he wants to roll the dice. We'll come back to court, and we'll see what happens. So those are the things that we have to deal with. So we have to play sociologists, psychologists, because we deal with you know, just to be honest, um, and police can attest as well, we do have a lot of people that have mental issues. Um, we all have something going on in this room. I tell my staff that all the time. So, um, so you know, that's what we do at that point. You know, we, you know, some of the things that we've done in 2019, just to let you know, um, your district actually had 600 and, 
or 412 uh, complaints that we assess within the city. Um, but we actually did uh, 7,714 7, inspections throughout the city. That's a citywide thing, as you were stating earlier. And proportionally, that was probably about 1,100 complaints or inspections he did in your district. And so, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, 770-224-0200. And just to let you know, there's about 30 of these presentations on the back table as well as my card, and also there's flyers on how to do our, you can actually go through our electronic portal as well and enter your complaints and check status. We deal with them primarily on the private property side, but we work collaboratively with the CAB PD to address those because just, Well, unfortunately, things like that, as I said, are ongoing. So the best thing to do is, is continue doing what you're doing, but you can also email me, uh, and we'll make sure we work. We have a good working relationship with the CAT PD, and I assure you Lieutenant Sowell, who is our police liaison, will send an officer out to try to address it. I have known them to tow several of those semis in the, since we've been a city. And to let you know, the, the tow semi is probably about $2,000. So, And you can also just, this is for free, you can also, if you know the trucking company, if you call them and ask to speak to the safety manager, which is what we do, he just did that this afternoon, as a matter of fact. Usually, and you tell them the truck number that's on the side of it, oh, they're gonna call that trucker. Cause they're like, oh no, he's not supposed to park there. Or she's not supposed to park there. He's supposed to park at the approved truck lots over in, uh, on Stone Mountain, like there on your road. And like, yeah, you can Google the US U.S. dot number as well on this, the U.S. DOT number on the side. Um, just some of the issues that we found, um, this is just like trash and debris. Oh, and I'll take questions at the end real quick. So let me get through the presentation because as, as the councilwoman stated, we have so much stuff going on tonight. Yes, so, so and, we'll, and I'll talk about that briefly at the end because you know, that's probably some of the main things that we deal with. But some of the things that Councilwoman Cobble and I, as we drove out a few weeks ago, this, just to let you know where this location is, uh, be specific, it's the Red Roof Inn. It's the hillside <laughs> that comes down behind like the MARTA, I guess the bus stop. Yeah, so it was just like litter and trash, <laughs> all like in the wood line area. It was just, it was pretty gross because he actually went out there the next day and was like, man, it's pretty bad. <laughs> we just saw it from the street, because I think it was raining that day. Um, but we know that you deal with a lot of litter and trash, and that's a citywide issue. And so what it boils down to is that's educating, you know, as many people as we can. And I believe in starting with the kids. So we're really trying to do something where we can partner with the schools, especially like the middle school, high school. Um, if you get to the kids, usually they'll tell you, you know, us adults, hey, man, don't throw that out. That's going into the storm drain. Um, and the reason you don't do that, just to let you know, it goes into the storm drain, which in turn gets into the river system, which in turn creates the more, more money that the county residents have to pay to have the water treatment system filtered. And so people don't understand. You wonder why your water rates are going up. That is part of the reason. I live in Fulton County, so trust me, I know <laughs> as well. Um, and so we try to talk about that a lot. Um, but those are some of the main things. Uh, again, property maintenance issues, I think this is behind the the, um, what's the place? The Walmart, that side parking lot, um, that side shopping, Rainbow. Yeah, the Rainbow. We went by there yesterday and it was today, was it? Was it today? Yesterday it was still, it was probably worse than it was two weeks ago. So most likely it's going to probably be a citation to the property owner because that's unacceptable. No one wants to live like that. I don't care what, what socioeconomic background you have, where you live at. I've worked in other jurisdictions. We still have these same issues, so don't, don't let anyone fool you. This happens in Sandy Springs where I came from as well. We, we deal with the Dollar Generals and 
Family Dollar's having issues and Publix having trash everywhere. Big Lots was our biggest one that had that type of issue. And so we deal with them the same way. And then this is just, you know, again, some of the main things we deal with property. And actually, I'll, this is not even, in, I don't think this is in your district because that's, well, actually, that's the house on Brisbane. It's not like that anymore, actually. The one on the right, um, the actual, it has actually been restored. And I should have put a picture in it. But we had, the t it had been like that 10 years until we became a city. I think I cited the owner, you know, the owner probably in what, April last year. She sold it in December, in November, an investor, we allowed her to sell it to an investor, he fixed it up in December. But understand it took us 10 years, the, the county had this house, it had been like this for almost 10 years, from what people were telling me, I don't know, but I know it was halfway dilapidated when we became a city in 2017. So it took us that long. So sometimes things do take a minute, but I promise you we will try to get to a resolution. If the city has to deal with it, we will deal with it as well. And then, you know, as, as people were saying, that's probably the one to the left is probably our biggest issue. That's probably the worst of the cases. But, but abandoned cars on the street, if I tell people like this, if you see a suspicious vehicle in your neighborhood and it's parked on the street, it's there, you know, you leave for work, you come back home, it's still there, call police. It could be stolen. We don't know. You know, police don't know. But if it doesn't look right, call police, let them investigate. You know, if you know, it's your neighbor who dropped it off there. You know, sometimes they're, you know, in transition trying to get it fixed, towed to a mechanic shop or put it in the garage or whatever the case may be. And then after a reasonable time, you know, that you feel comfortable, then, you know, call it in and we'll, you know, collaboratively we'll work together to resolve it. Um, but it has, if it's on the street, it has to have current tags and insurance and be operable, not wrecked. If it's in your driveway, the same thing. So if you put it in your garage, that's your garage. I can't tell you what to do in your garage. So or your carport that is covered um, from that perspective. And then this is just, again, the, the trash and debris throughout the city, different locations. Um, and that's kind of what we do. And then we deal with sign enforcement. Um, Jacob, one, every one of my officers has a project. He has signs. So he has been actually categorizing all the signs throughout the city right now. I think you're just around the mall area. You just finished that. And so he goes, and so our plan is as a new city, from my previous experience, you want to know what your signs look like today because trust me, sign companies come in and they can have a sign up in like 24 hours. So we leave on Friday, they can have a sign up by Monday and we're like, well, what was the sign? What did it look like? So what we're doing is categorizing them, working with GIS, working with Chris, our plan director, to have a catalog and then eventually we may try to put it on our, on our uh, GIS map, but it just may be too comprehensive. But we do internally have one, so. Oh. I'll take a couple questions. If not, all my contact information is in the back. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back, and then I'll come to you, and I'll come to you. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Uh, well, okay, so um, our deputy city manager, uh, George Joyner, will probably discuss some of that when he talks about the transportation plan, but the best thing to do is just, is to talk, is to go to our website. We have a GIS map on there, and you can actually just, Take a picture of it, download it, and it gets categorized to him, and then he will, you know, route it to appropriate parties. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, yeah, the best thing to do, yes, so the best thing to do is call our call center. If you can take a picture of it, 
you know, of course, don't put yourself in danger or anything like that. So, because I'm presuming it's the same truck, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so if we can get a picture of it that at least shows the side of where the numbers are and possibly. But, but it should have a DOT number, which is the national part. The, the federal government requires that all those trucks have that number be visible. So if so, we can go to their website and pull up the trucking information for it. Um, but if you can just, you know, the best of your ability is to take a picture of it. Call our call center as well as call PD, and we'll we'll definitely try to address it. I know they come and go, so. Unfortunately, he, he or she may have to get a ticket or it get towed, and then they'll understand. So, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hmm? No. So this is, this is where we're having, and, and our deputy city manager is also our public works director for the city, and so we're working out some engagement agreements with the county because if you refer a detention pond to me, and what we will do, the county still should maintain them. Now the problem is, the county only main, they maintain some, because, because we're finding this out. There's some agreements that they still maintain, maybe the one in your neighborhood, but the neighborhood next door, they don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say this, send, send that to me, and what I will do is I'll reach out to the, the county inspector for um, detention ponds, it's Inspector Caldwell, and so I'll reach, and Terrence Simpson is, is his boss, and I'll send them an email saying, hey, at 123 Main Street, there's a detention pond behind it, you know, these houses, they say the county used to maintain it, and he'll do his research to see where everything is deeded and platted, I don't know. Um, but in some cases, they still do maintain them, and then they put them on a work order to do so. Um, as you know, the county is trying to be extensive in, in maintaining all the detention ponds throughout the county. So, and in some cases, it may revert back to the HOA. I just don't know. We don't have all those records, unfortunately. So the best thing to do is call it in. We'll, we'll try to help facilitate who should maintain it, uh, you know, and at least get it to that perspective. So, Anyone else? Oh, yes, ma'am. It's probably a cable line, most likely. Because, um, well, I mean, the utilities are still handled by those respective parties. So if it's Comcast, AT&T, Georgia Power, I would, fair to say that it's probably an AT&T line or a Comcast line, because it wouldn't be a live Georgia Power line. I, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be live, I promise you. <laughs> the, everybody be getting sued. So most likely it's one of those, but um, one thing I would suggest doing, you know, possibly contacting either Comcast or AT&T, but you can also send it to us, and most likely that's all we're gonna do is con contact them through the same 800 channel, and they will put a work order in, because I think we had the one, but Comcast last week was in District 3, so we found an, an issue. Well, it was another location, but same thing. The, a tree was leaning on a what we thought was a power line. It was actually a cable line. Um, we determined that it was. He called Comcast after meeting with the Georgia Power folks, and probably within 24 hours, they were out there getting rid of the tree leaning on the line. So, so I mean, it's just squeaky wheel gets the you know gets the oil, I guess you know, or you know gets that that issue. So, there was a gentleman in the back, yes, sir. I'm going to say this, in the Cap County days, it is, but let's be honest, they shouldn't block the roadway, I agree, they should be respectful, I agree, but we got to find a balance, kids need something to do, and so, you know. Well, 
what we do in, in some occasion is if it becomes a traffic hazard, we will go out, leave a notice, and tell them to at least remove it once they can finish playing. Um, but we try to we try to find the balance for them. I mean, honestly, you know, kids, we don't have a lot of recreation centers like we do like when we were kids, and this is just one way for them to to, you know, kind of explore that. But, you know, let's let's be neighborly, talk to the neighbors, the parents first if we can, and then if it becomes an issue, of course, don't put yourself in any danger, but, you know, let's try to work it out. But it is a violation by county code, which is the same code that we have, yes. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, good, good question. If you see a yellow sign from my department, what we're doing is proactive code enforcement. We're trying to curtail, and, and we did it, we started last June, we did probably about 10 neighborhoods last year throughout the city, throughout every district, at least one or two. And what it is, we'll put out the signs for like two or three days saying, hey, we're coming through in the next week. My staff didn't believe it was gonna happen, but I said, watch, you're gonna have either people calling on their neighbors, saying, hey, look behind my neighbor's house, there's a car back there, or, People are going to start calling and say, hey, I know you're coming through. What do I do to make sure I don't get in trouble? And both of those things happen. And so what it does is creates community engagement. It allows actually reduced calls. And so a lot of times my officers, they drive through the neighborhood first to kind of see what the neighborhood looks like. And then they put the sign out, come back probably in about a week or so, and they'll say, hey, you know, the car was gone, the trash was gone. <laughs> Somebody will cut the grass, things happen. So now you've cleaned up your neighborhood, and then we focus in on the ones that are still, quote unquote, in violation. Um, we give them a notice, um, and we allow them a time, usually, you know, a time to comply. And if they comply, we come back, reinspect, and we're done. We actually had, when we did that, we started the program, we had about a 90% compliance rate. So we only wrote probably maybe 15 citations out of all the neighborhoods that we did last year. All right. So if you have any more questions, I'll be here. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Truly really low hanging fruit for us to get some work done very quickly. And they've done a lot in District Three and, and I send them emails and text messages all the time <laughs> whenever I see anything. So if you see something um, and you have my number, shoot me a text or an email. So I can get in touch with them and we just keep that line of communication open. Al, will you do me a favor and try to figure out what happened here? Um, so we're gonna move on to Parks and Recs. Sean, if you'll come up. Sean De Palma is our director for Stonecrest Parks and Recs. Um, we've done, last year we had our first and, and we're planning two more for this year. Um, Green on the Green is a partnership with Stonecrest Fest and Farrington Park. So in District 3, Farrington Park is our Parks and Recs Park. Um, but Sean and his team are doing a fantastic job um, across the city with Parks and Recs. So he's going to come and talk to us a little bit about Parks and Recs program um, and a little bit about, about what we're doing in District 3. Skippy? Good. Here we go. Good evening. Good evening. I am Sean De Palma. I am the Parks and Recreation Director. Before I go into our department, I just wanted to um, just grant uh, appreciation to our Code Enforcement Department. They do help us out in the Parks Department tremendously, especially when we have issues of uh, legal dumping or individuals doing uh, mechanical work on vehicles in the parks. They're there to help and guide us and support us, so we've always uh, appreciate them and and you can tell why as um mr um al alejandro went through his um presentation uh as councilwoman mentioned we are a brand new department we're less than uh, we're about a year old now as far as staffing on the ground but as uh far as acquiring parks we did that of last year august 1st and we acquired nine parks from dekalb county in their current state from DeKalb County, and now we're bringing it to another uh, state of condition by planning and budgeting and, and going out and doing repairs. As far as District 3, there is a park in District 3, and that is Farrington Park. 
In addition to that, last year, mayor and council did purchase uh, another piece of property at the end of this um, Farrington Parkway, uh, which was prior years prior a golf course. It's 60, roughly 62 acres, and it is slated to become a uh, recreation center, community center with a police, substa sta police substation in it. In addition to that, it's slated to get beautified and become what truly would be a sanctuary, uh, sanctuary and a gathering place for the community. Uh, and, and that is a big deal, and, and we're excited about that. Currently, the department's going through master planning. As you know, the whole city's brand new. It's less than three years old. Uh, there's a transportation master plan that there's some information in the back, and it will be discussed uh, in a little while. Uh, but there's also a parks and recreation master plan. Why we're going through that is so that we can identify what the citizen tree wants, what you want for your parks and recreation department going in the future, identify what we actually own and what we have in place today, and the gap between that, what it's going to cost, and how we can get there. That's what that master plan is going to be doing. Uh, and, and we're just ramping up with programming. We do have um, a small business expo coming up on the 29th of this month, and that'll be Saturday at Browns Mill. And then in addition to that, we are going to have a job fair next month at Browns Mill as well. We're increasing programming. We added pickleball. We have abs guru um, for the older active adult in the, in the building in Browns Mill twice a, a week. And we're just building up programming. Recently, we got licensed by the state of Georgia to have our youth program and our after school program in the building. It's the first time that that building was licensed to actually have a program in there from the Department of um, Youth and um, Department that regulates uh, with the state of Georgia that regulates uh, youth programs and after school programs. So that was an accomplishment as well. Uh, our department, like I said, we built it from scratch. And we have uh, nine individuals of our nine staff. Uh, they're very highly trained. Uh, we have about a, um, we're about 90% at a bachelor's degree or higher education. And the majority of my staff have a uh, professional experience of over a decade on average. So we, we built a very quality team to serve the community. Uh, we also just launched our Facebook page this week which the handle is Stonecrest Parks Rex, R-E-C-S, at the end of that, all one word. And if you would like us on that and look at our page and share it, we'd appreciate it. And I'm available for any questions. Like Councilwoman did say, uh, we will have two Screen on the Greens this year at Farrington. Last year we had one uh, at the back end of the year, I believe in September. Yes. And it, it was a great success, as they say, great success. And um, we enjoyed it, and now we're going to be bringing it back next year. Do you have any questions? I also have my, our programmer, um, Ms. Tamika Porter. Can you stand up for a moment? No, no, don't raise your hand. Stand up. Ms. Ms. Porter is one of that staff that I did mention. She's working diligently, and she's also someone not only uh, went to a training today at 8 o'clock. She had to be there in the morning. She's here tonight, and most of the staff is diligent and, and works that way, you know, um, for the city. But if you do have a, a concept, an idea, or a suggestion for a program that you want to bring into the city and into our parks department, uh, Ms. Porter is definitely the person to speak to. Uh, like I said, we added pickleball recently, which is to diversify uh, the programming offered. We're about to add um, uh, netball, gymna gymnastics, and uh, some other activities. We have a professional uh, basketball team that does play at a ba um, Browns Mill Park, which is the Georgia Kangaroos. And we will have a full operating, well-programmed summer camp for the youth this year as well. And uh, we're looking to serve you in anything that you would like uh, to see happen in your parks and, um, and, and in recreation. We're here for you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. No, the number for Browns Mill is 470-552-5500. So it's 470-552-PARK. 
And that's the easiest way to remember it, the word park. Any, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thanks, Alan. I just want to let everyone know that if you um, need an address change or a name change, the deadline for registration is Monday. The main office will be open to 530. So if anybody that you know needs to have a name change or an address change, they can do it online, which will be registered to vote at um, sos.ga.gov. Or they can pick up an application over here if you know someone. I have them. And if you have a family member that votes absentee, I have applications for those as well because they do have to do an absentee ballot application every election year if they're over 65. Um, everyone else uh, 65 and under has to do it every election. So if you need any of those, I have those available with me. I apologize for some of this technology. It, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it is, well, ish. That's a pretty picture, but <laughs> not the presentation. <laughs> okay. So next on our list, sorry, one second. Here we go. Or not. Next on our list is our transportation master plan. Uh, Katrina Highsmith is going to come up and talk to us a little bit about our transportation master plan. Katrina is from the collaborative firm. Um, we have, we have uh, used a collaborative firm for a few things here in Stonecrest. Um, our comprehensive plan was one of them. So the next thing that they're doing for us is a transportation plan. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, a huge component in this for citizen engagement. So I wanted to bring her up here and have her talk to us about how we can be involved um, there's a survey online, and, and there's all kind of ways that we can get involved in what our transportation plan will look like in the future. So I want to bring Katrina up here and, and walk us through that. Thank you, oh, excuse me, Councilwoman Cabo, and good evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Katrina Highsmith. I'm the manager in, of marketing and communications at the collaborative firm and also public lead for the City of Stonecrest Transportation Master Plan. Um, if you have not heard of the Transportation Master Plan, it is a plan that has a 20-year vision for the City of Stonecrest to help with transportation issues as well as mobility solutions within the city and also plans to connect us to the region as, as well as um, downtown Atlanta and uh, the airport. So uh, we have been working on this plan for a few months now and we have um, used social media to try to engage with the community for them to take our online survey, which is located here on the city of Stonecrest's website. So we have extended the survey. So if you have some time, please, uh, we encourage you to take the survey so we can understand what your needs are within the city. I do have some collateral in the back as far as a fact sheet. We have a sign up sheet if you're interested to learn more. We have comment cards as well. So you can visit me in the back at the, the table if you have any additional questions. Um, I have work, been working alongside Mr. Pledge Joyner um, throughout this process, so he's gonna speak a little bit on uh, the transportation master plan. Um, again, I think that's, yeah. So really I just would like people to take the survey. Um, again, it's located here on the city's website. I have some fact sheets so can answer some additional questions for you, but um, as of right now, if you have any questions, you feel free to reach me in, in the back. You want to say anything first? I'll go away, Katrina. Katrina wants to hide out. Actually, the, the, we've, we've been working very closely with the uh, collaborative firm for the past uh, five or six months, actually. Um, and so they've been, we've been doing a couple of pop-up meetings around the city, as well as having some focus groups uh, with, with, with various uh, distinct groups that, that are here uh, that, that we want to gather the information. Uh, once again, as she stated, uh, the transportation master plan is basically going to be the roadmap 
for the direction of Stonecrest, uh, for, especially in our transportation needs in the upcoming 20 years. So not only does it handle the roads and the streets uh, where we're going to be putting traffic signals and uh, roundabouts and those type of things, but we're also very excited about extending the uh, trail that comes out of Arabia Mountain. Uh, we have about probably about 20 miles of trail that goes through Arabia Mountain right now. But what we'd like to do is we'd like to connect the entire city, all of our neighborhoods, all of our parks, um, connect them to our retail centers as well as our industrial parks so that folks can get around the city without using your car. So you can, if, if people like to run and jog, if you like to get out on your bike, uh, walk around, we want to make the city entirely walkable and, uh, and, and connected through our trail system as well. So uh, we're actually collecting all of that information. Uh, please go online when you have a chance to take the survey. Uh, we've, we're compiling the information that we have so, thus far but we're continuing to leave it open so that folks who still want to uh, contribute can uh, add, add their input as well. Okay. Are there any questions for Katrina? I know there's some questions for her. Here we go. I know it. I'm sorry, do I know the distance from the trail for what? Yeah, now you're saying, are you hunting? Okay, all righty. And are you shooting with a gun or a bow and arrow? Okay. Uh, we'll have to we'll have to research that if, if you if you can look at uh, check check in with us after the meeting and uh, give us give us your information we'll, we'll have to research that I didn't know people were yeah. oh actually uh, Council, Councilman George Turner may have some information especially around bow hunting Yes. I'm sorry, can you speak up? I am not. Yeah. No, but Plez will probably speak to you on that when he gets into the DeKalb Spa portion of the program. Yeah, she will. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Okay, I'm going to defer to Plez. Uh, thank you, Katrina. Um, actually, uh, the the city is going. To, uh, the city of Stonecrest is actually working closely with DeKalb County, as well as with MARTA and GDOT, uh, to look at. Uh, and actually, this this transportation plan is actually going to be looking at all of those components and see ways that that, that we can uh, mitigate our traffic, as well as find ways for folks to uh, you know uh, to increase the mass transit here in the uh, in the Stonecrest area. Uh, we have had some discussions with MARTA about extending the uh, the rail line from uh, Indian Creek into Stonecrest, so there are some discussions around that. Uh, there was a study that was completed 
by DeKalb County last year. And so actually the transportation master plan will be looking at those plans and those uh, that, that particular master plan as, as they set forth the, the plans for the city going forward. Uh, once again, you want to keep in mind that, that the transportation master plan is a 20-year plan. So this is, this is not stuff that we're just going to be doing just in the next one or two years, but it's, but it's what our plan is going to look like for the next 20 years, okay? Okay, I believe you're, uh, I think it was like a charrette. That, that, yeah, that, that was what he's talking about. Okay, so what we'll be doing is there will be a transportation summit yes. uh, that, that, that we are actually working on that is con in conjunction with the mass, uh, with this transportation master plan. So once again, uh, please go take the, take the survey. We're, we're gathering email addresses from folks. And uh, we'll be publicizing when that transportation summit will take place. And that will give you the opportunity to, to get some of the feedback that we've gotten from the surveys, as well as provide some input as, as to what our direction needs to be for the city. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So once again, when we do the uh, transportation summit, we have not set the date for that, if I'm correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, so sometime in the next uh, three to four months, we'll be having that. And uh, we'll, once again, we'll, we'll be publicizing. Uh, we'll be making sure each of the council persons know uh, when this is going on. And we, we want to get as we want to get as many people out and, and participate as possible. Any other questions? Why did you mention that? Actually, earlier this week, uh, we, we had a meeting with, with some of the folks uh, in conjunction with the Arabia Mountain uh, Trail System and the PATH Foundation. And uh, so actually, that's going to be Katrina's next meeting is uh, we're pulling together folks from the Arabia Mountain Trail System, uh, the PATH Foundation, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, building out our trail network here in Stonecrest, ultimately to actually connect that with the Atlanta Beltline. Any other questions? Okay, and if you guys have any, I'll be here to the end of the meeting. Thank you for your time. I'll stay here. I'll stay here. First, I want to thank the councilwoman for uh, putting my slide presentation together for me. <laughs> All righty. Uh, once again, my name is Plez Joyner. I'm the deputy city manager uh, for the city of Stonecrest, as well as the director of our public works. And I've been brought forward to talk about our splost. And I'm sure I'm going to field a couple of questions about all of the potholes that are, that are uh, proliferating here in the city. Um, actually, I did hand out something. It looks like this. It says, uh, your, penny, your, your penny's at work. And uh, th this is just, just an update uh, here. Uh, we updated our information as of today uh, with information about, the, uh, about our SPLOS uh, endeavors for this year. Uh, we went before the city council about uh, two meetings ago and got their permission to move forward with our 2020 uh, pavement and resurfacing plan. And in this, uh, in this handout uh, is, are the 37 streets that are going to be resurfaced within the city. So uh, we have a very ambitious plan. Uh, last year we did a little over about, about 22, 23 streets were done last year. Uh, but this year we're going to be doing uh, quite a bit more. And uh, it will be a little bit more comprehensive than last year. Um, this year we're going to be doing uh, about 37 roads are going to be done. 
Um, also in the handout that I gave you, there should be a little map on there so you can see, see where all the streets are, are actually located within the area. Um, 37 roads, approximately 34 lane miles. Um, we say lane miles because the, that, that's not the, that, that's, that's how wide the roads are. So some roads are a lot wider than others. Uh, so like, you know, Mall Parkway, it's like five lanes across in some places where the streets that go, go through your uh, subdivision are usually like only two lanes. Um, we're looking at estimates are about $6.5 million of, uh, for, for, this, for this project that will be coming up this year. Um, actually, we just met yesterday with the companies that are going to be bidding on the project. So it looked like about six or seven com companies are going to be bidding on it. So we're looking to get some very good prices on this as well. We're, uh, this year, um, as, as opposed to last year, if you recall, we f when we first started last year, we picked a lot of different streets. I think we started with like 18 streets. There were, there were little small streets, cul-de-sacs and those type of things. Uh, this year, we're going to be concentrating more on major thoroughfares throughout the city. And the, the uh, thought being that when we do like a cul-de-sac, uh, who lives on a cul-de-sac? Uh, show of hands. You live on a cul-de-sac, what, about six, seven houses on your cul-de-sac, right? Uh, maybe 10 cars are going in and out on your cul-de-sac. So when we pave a cul-de-sac, those, those 8 to 10 cars are, are who benefits from, from that cul-de-sac being uh, paved. But if we pave a road like... Uh, uh, Thompson Mill Road uh, that we paved last year. That was a we did about a mile and a half of Thompson Mill Road, the entirety of Thompson Mill Road. We have literally thousands of people driving up and down Thompson Mill Road every single day, and and so we get a lot more bang for our buck when we do our major thoroughfares. So we're going to really concentrate on doing the major thoroughfares first, and then we're going to come back and 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 concentrate on on the subdivisions a little bit more. Um, but you will notice uh, on the list, and I have all the streets listed here, we are going into some subdivisions. And uh, you may notice one of the subdivisions that we're doing is, is it called Regency? Regency Woods. Regency Woods. Uh, we did target some subdivisions that were in a uh, very poor condition. And we said, uh, well, we can't wait. We can't wait any longer to get these done. So Regency Woods, that entire, uh, the other, the second thing that we're doing, so number one, we're doing major thoroughfares. Number two, if we go into a subdivision, we're going to pave the entire subdivision. So we're not just going to do one or two little cul-de-sacs in, in a subdivision. We're going to pave the entire thing. So what we're, so our strategy is major thoroughfares first and then entire subdivision. So we're looking at the entirety of a subdivision and making sure that it's, uh, you know, ranks very high on our list. Uh, to get that done. Uh, in addition, there there were a couple of there were a couple of co uh, couple of subdivisions that were not completed by their builders, and so we're going in and finishing those up as well. So that that's on our list. And last but not least, I did want to um, highlight the major thoroughfares that we're going to be doing. So uh, Mall Parkway, we're going to be doing uh, Mall Parkway between Klondike Road and Evans Mill Road. Um, that is a, it is, it's, it's a hazard. Okay. Uh, I, I live here in Stonecrest myself and uh, I, I hate driving, especially between Klondike and Evans Mill Road. So we're going to be doing that. The entirety of Farrington Road, and that, that's right there in the heart of, of District 3, uh, from Panola Road all the way to Hillendale. So we're doing the entirety of Farrington Road is being repaved uh, this year. Uh, Panola Road is being done. Uh, Evans Mill Road, once again, there's a lot of potholes along that one. I, I went along that last week and I counted about 20 potholes just between Salem Road and uh, Rock Springs Road. Uh, we're also going to be doing part, a portion of Rock Springs Road. So, so from Cleveland uh, up until Panola Road, we'll be doing Rock Springs. Cross Vale between Evans Mill Road and Salem Road. And also Phillips Road is, is particularly bad as well. So Phillips Road between Covington Highway and Margaret Road are being done. Uh, last but not least, and then I'll start taking some questions. I did want to go over some of the financial data. Um, a lot of times folks are just wondering, uh, how much money are we collecting from SPLOSS? So we're on track. We're actually collecting about, on average, about $627,000 
per month is coming to the city of Stonecrest. So every single month, month over month, yeah, you can you can clap, yeah, <laughs> uh, because uh, we are the, we are the largest city in, in DeKalb County, so we get the largest share of the money uh, that that's coming out of DeKalb County. So out of that six hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars since since Sploss began back in twenty eighteen, the the city has collected thirteen million five hundred fifty-five thousand three hundred seventy-one dollars um, of that amount. Uh, we, we're really being very judicious with our money. So we're just not spending it as it, as it shows up, but we're, we're being very careful about how we're spending our money and being very, uh, being very careful with it. So we've only spent uh, five, just a little over $5 million has been spent so far. So that leaves us, we have about eight and a half million dollars sitting in the bank uh, today is, is sitting there. Um, and keep in mind that six hundred and twenty-seven thousand dollars is still rolling in every single month. So we're 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 taking our time. Um, we understand that that we do have a lot of things we want to get done and a lot of things that we need to fix. But we don't want to make sure we 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 need to make sure that we're not throwing away our our money because it's it's not we're not going to get a second chance at it. So we're we're just taking our time and doing it that way. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and open it up for some questions. Uh, we'll start right here and here, and I know there's one in the back as well. Right, right, yeah, chop, chop, chop way that runs right. out there, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Great, great question. Great question. And and actually, what I'm about to say may answer a bunch of folks' questions. Uh, number one, uh, you really need to pave over your roads every 10 to 15 years. So, oh yeah, I, believe me, I understand. Uh, so every 10 to 15 years, the roads need to be repaved to, to stay in good condition. Um, here in Stonecrest, unfortunately, hardly any of our roads have been paved really in the last 20 years. I, I've, my, I built my house 20, exactly 20 years ago. The street that I live on has never been paved since, I, since I've lived here. So we are, th this is a problem that did not start last year, did not start three years ago when the city started. Uh, this is a problem that's been festering and has been waiting for us to start uh, for the past, um, uh, really, really for the past 20 years. So what we're going to be doing is uh, we, we, work with, we work very closely with DeKalb County to repave the roads, uh, excuse me, to fill the potholes. One issue that we're having right now is that, as you under, as you probably know, it's been raining for about three weeks now, uh, it's, and it's kind of cold, it's kind of chilly, and it's raining. Unfortunately, they cannot fill a pothole until until it stops raining, until the ground is dry, until it warms up a little bit. So we are kind of in a kind of in a bit of a quandary because the longer that it rains, the worse the potholes get. As you understand, they, they just get worse and worse. So I, I am just imploring everybody that I speak to. You know, I have a, I have a teenage daughter who just started driving, and I'm like, uh, darling, you just have to slow down, take your time, uh, because these potholes are something that, you know, we even, uh, you, you probably, you know where they are. Slow down and don't, don't, run, don't run your car through those potholes because, uh, you know, DeKalb County is, will not be able to get out to fix them. Uh, it's going to probably be another week or so before we'll even before the skies even clear up, and then keep in mind that DeKalb County is covering all of DeKalb County. So uh, you know, I'm I'm sending reports every day to to the county and letting them know about uh, you know the, the the councilwoman has been done a great job of alerting me to uh, the potholes that I don't get to, and we just turn around get them to, to DeKalb County. They have a very I'm sure they have a very long list right now. And uh, we're just going to have to be very, very careful and very diligent as, as, as we go and get those fixed. Um, correct, correct. Yeah, but, but that one, one, one or two more things. Um, now, 
it, it takes DeKalb County a while to get out to it because DeKalb County is about 1,800 miles of roadway. And uh, so we just have to get in line with, with the other 1,800 miles of roadway. So our plan is for the city of Stonecrest to begin taking over filling those potholes. Um, that is something that, that's on our list of things to do this year. And our plan is to transition and start filling potholes ourselves by the end of this year. Hopefully uh, that, will, that will alleviate a bit of the problem. Number one is that we're, we'll be a lot closer to the problem. Um, we, there'll be a lot fewer potholes for us to fill. And we should be able to go out and dispatch somebody to fix them, you know, on a, on a daily basis and get, get them all taken care of. So that, that's what our plan is to do. Uh, we're bringing on another person in our public works department actually starting next week. And uh, that, that's really going to be the job is to assess where we are and then uh, put together a budget and decide uh, what's, what's going to be our best way to, to, to attack that problem. Uh, yeah, so, so what we're doing is we're, we're spending uh, the most of the money is going to our major thoroughfares, but we're still looking at, at uh, some of the subdivisions. Um, and I, I know exactly the subdivision you're talking about that, that, that was only done. We we're using our, the way that we we're doing it last year, just looking at a street or two here and a street or two there. So, um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, believe me, I understand. <laughs> Right, right. And I, I remember talking, are, are, uh, are you the HOA president? Okay, I, I, we may have even spoken on the phone a few times ab about that. So um, so our, our plan is, you know, I really can't give you a, a firm date as to when we're going to do it. But, you know, that, that, is a, that area is very high on our list to, to get done. Yeah, so, so what, what we can promise to do is we can get out there and let, let's, let's endeavor to make sure that we get those potholes filled and get those patched up and get, and get the road at least uh, so that you can ride on them. And then, and then the next step will then be looking at, you know, when we'll be able to pave, pave them over because really the ideal situation is just to pave it over and, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. But the issue is we have so many roads to, to get done that, that it would just be impossible just to say, we're, we're going to do this road. We'll be doing that one next year type of thing. Okay. Uh, we had one here, and then, then we'll stop over here. Right, correct. Yeah, so right there at the corner of Rock Springs and Panola Road. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, j just to let you know, actually, last year, uh, we, we actually did a study of the entire city. And so we do have a database of every street in the city, and each, and each subdivision has a ranking uh, that, that's already been attributed to it. And so basically, we're starting at the top of that list of the worst streets, and we're just working down through that list. Correct, correct, right, right. Um, you know what I'll do is um, we'll, we'll have that, I'll, I'd like to have that conversation with, with the city council and uh, to discuss the best means of, of sharing that information. Um, uh, like I said, we do have that information and, and that, that would be a good idea um, and to, to let folks know, you know, sort of where, where they fall on that list. Great, great idea. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we've posted the actual Stantec uh, data. You know, with, with the list, so that that's why I wanted to have the discussion with with, with the council, right, right. Yeah. 
say it's sort of like work. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that is a great idea. So um, I'll, I'll put that on our list for, for Monday's meeting and ju just, just to have a quick, quick cursory discussion about that, and then, then we can decide uh, what's, what's the best way to, way to do that. Okay. Uh, a young lady here in the red. Uh, are, are you talking, is that Panola Industrial there? Yeah, so that's Panola Industrial at Miller Road, right. Okay, yeah, yeah, so, so actually, we'll, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take this up at our, at our city council meeting on, on Monday evening, and uh, when I, if I get the green light, we'll, we'll post that the next day, okay? Right. Yep. Yeah. Right. Right. And and we we did something similar to that last year. As as we were doing the streets, we were highlighting the ones that we we're doing, and then uh, we we're basically crossing off the ones that we that we were done to to we, till we got to the end of the list. But the, but these are all some great 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 ideas. No, it's not. <laughs> Right, right, right. Yeah, and that that is, and and actually, yeah, and actually, actually, and and the question, the the issue was the eighteen wheelers that are cutting through. Especially, I, I've seen more eighteen wheelers coming down Thompson Mill Road than than I than, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I've seen I've seen them on I've seen them on Evans Mill Road as well. Um, what one issue is. Some of our streets are designated as tr as truck routes, and so they, you know, it's legal for them to go along them. Uh, we will have to work with uh, GDOT and uh, DeKalb County to to actually examine those roads and see whether if if there's some way that we could put some type of restrictions on on them coming down the streets. Um, one of the unintended consequences of something like uh, Waze and Google Maps and those type of things. If you're sitting out on I-20, and if we've all been out there trying to get past Wesley Chapel Road, and it's backed up to uh, Lithonia Industrial Boulevard, and you get on ways and say, get me around this thing, and it takes you, get off on Panola Road, hang a left, and then go down Thompson Mill, get off at Snapfinger, and then go to I-20 from there. Correct. So... Right, right. And so uh, one, uh, one other component of the transportation master plan is we are going to be looking at several um, dangerous intersections in the city. And so that Miller Road, Thompson Mill Road is one of those intersections that we're actually going to be doing a traffic study. And uh, more than likely, uh, you know, there, there's been a request to put a traffic light there. Um, to be honest with you, I, I'm not sure if that's going to help us much. I think we need to do something and maybe even widen that road a little bit and do some, do some other things with it because it's really, it is not suitable for 18 wheelers to come up and down that.
the way we the, the kind of way here's a leader here's a leader they need get on go Yeah, and and uh, in, in in defense of of our area and uh, DeKalb County, th this place grew uh, dramatically. Uh, and and if anybody who's been here twenty to thirty years understands that, if you if you showed up out here thirty years ago. Uh, there was a few, uh, you know, uh, cow pastures and cow farms and stuff. Uh, <laughs> Councilman Turner is there laughing because that, that's exactly like it was when he built his house out here. Um, but then uh, when you got to about the year in the late 90s, early 2000s, the, the uh, subdivisions are just popping up all over the place. And the infrastructure of the area did not keep up with all the building and stuff that went on. So... All of those nice apartments that were built along Farrington Road and also on Hillendale Road, um, built along Farrington Parkway, they're all just thrown up there. And then there was no way for the folks that were, you know, that were living there to walk to, uh, you know, because back then there was no, there was no Walmart, there was no Lowe's, there was no Publix up on Panola Road. So they just built the stuff. And they put a maybe put a martyr stop out there, but you know they, you were just expected hop in your car, get on I twenty, and go to civilization. So we are we are as I stated before, we are catching up to we're about twenty years behind where we need to be, and so we have a lot of stuff to do. One of the companies that's working on our transportation master plan that is their specialty is sidewalks. That's all that's all this company does. So they're doing an assessment of of where we need sidewalks in Stonecrest. Um, that's going to be part of the transportation summit when we actually have it. And so they are actually going to be able to show you where we need to put sidewalks, where we're missing sidewalks and those type of things. I live down Thompson Mill Road. I, I say this everywhere I go. I would love to be able to walk up to Panola Road to the Publix and get my uh, sub sandwich for, for lunch uh, sometimes. I just can't do it because there's no sidewalks along there. and Cars are zipping along at 40 miles an hour. So um, so that is, as, as the uh, Councilwoman Cabo said, that is that's top top of our list is is, is is really just examining what we're missing and we're missing a whole lot and uh, and really we just got to figure out what we're missing and then put a plan in place as, as, as to how we're going to get there. Oh yeah, 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 uh, yeah. The, the councilwoman and I, we 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 grew up up north. Uh, she grew up in Philly. I, I grew up in New York, and so um, you know, streets and and everything and sidewalks is something you didn't even think about. But you know, living here, this was the cab South DeKalb County was a was a bedroom community. So this was a place where you just came, you just came home in the evening and went to bed, and then in the morning you got in your car and you went somewhere else to work. So we're, we're really having, we have a lot of work to do to sort of change what that paradigm is of, of where we are 
and and that's the way that's the way it is. All the roads just led to get on the interstate to get out of here. You just need one way to get to the interstate. So you know that that's that's why that's where we are. Uh, I have a, one more question. We're here in the back. Excellent question, and uh, actually, that is one more thing the city is go is transitioning to take over. So we're we're transitioning uh, right now. The cab clean and beautiful uh, do does that kind of thing, uh, picking up trash and those kind of kind of things. But once again, they have to do it for the entire DeKalb County. So the city of Stonecrest is looking at uh, f finding the funding for us to do the right of way maintenance for ourselves. And uh, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to take all of these types of things that the city can do more effectively than a county can do. Not because the county is bad at doing it, but it's just because the county is so, is so big and we're a lot smaller. And so we should be able to take care of a lot of these things ourselves. And so that, that's the plan to transition to right of way. So our plan this year for public works is the transition right of way maintenance, as you mentioned, uh, taking over the potholes. Uh, that we've talked about, and then the traffic signals and um, uh, the roads and the drainage will, will be coming under the purview of the city uh, as as we as we progress to this year. Okay, uh, one last question, and Miss.
stay on they are. For districts, and the district that I have right here in this talk about what is your role in this building. Being a business in our city, our people care that keep pushing that for them. A right away next week, we'll be able to uh, have to go away. So we'll be able to convince really have mitigate your long term because we can hear you get out of Those are such a temporary solution. We really got to get together. Um, two of them combined is really going to Get all that under one umbrella. Really try to, and we have to I, I promise you that we'll. Serve our schools. Kind of jumping the off. Kind of do that. Yeah, 
First of all, good evening, everyone. Um, I received the invitation to talk about MARTA, I think a day or so ago. So um, this is very impromptu. I represent the uh, entire county of MARTA, of DeKalb County, I'm sorry. I've got MARTA on the brain. I was in a Mar at a MARTA meeting this today. Uh, I was appointed to the MARTA board by the CEO and voted on by the commissioners in April of 2019. So since I've been on the MARTA board, I understand that the south end of DeKalb has felt very underserved. And because of that, I was asked to please do what I could to make sure that not only the entire county of DeKalb, but to really realize that the south end has not had the representation that it has felt that it should have had. And so with that being said, that has been my priority and agenda, and that is to make sure some of the promises that were made years ago to DeKalb will go into effect. With that being said, on last week, DeKalb County Commissioners did vote and approve the 15th Amendment or MARTA. Now you say, what is that? When MARTA was established, that was Amendment 1. This is the 15th time that MARTA would have been updated since MARTA was established between Fulton and DeKalb County 40 years ago. If you know, they actually had their 40-year celebration. I think it was in December. With that being said, I'm just going to highlight a couple things and then I will be available because I know your time is running late to answer any one-on-one -on -one questions that you may have. First of all, what's very important is I hear you talk about trash. And that is one of the things that we have asked Marta to do is that every bus stop that they put a trash can. And because when people are waiting, if they're drinking something, if they're eating something, they're going to leave it there. So those, the, that's one of the things that I'm concentrating specifically on, that they put trash bins at every bus stop. In the past year, MARTA has increased 70 shelters in DeKalb County, and I have a list of the locations. I heard them talk about the master plan. One of the specific plans that I have asked MARTA to do, and only in support of the 15th Amendment, is that they would... Uh, put our train stations in South DeKalb, meaning Kensington and Indian Creek, in a state of good repair. They were putting off starting at the Indian Creek station in 2021. I said to the CEO, that is not acceptable. I know you have the votes to the CEO of MARTA. I said to him at the time, I know you have the votes to get this amendment out of committee. But I will make sure that the CEO of DeKalb and the other commissioners know that I did not support this amendment unless you can find a way to start rehabilitating the, the Indian Creek Station in DeKalb in 2020. That was amended in the board meeting, and they will start working in 2020 on the Indian Creek Station. Also, there is, thank you. It was not easy, but we made it happen, so I'm excited about that. Uh, also, there is a plan to create two transit centers in the south end of DeKalb, one in the south DeKalb area and the other one in the Stonecrest area. 
So those will be, um, I have the dates. I don't have them right readily here. Oh, yes, I do. The planning phase will start this year. Construction will be in the next two years. So for those of you that are asking about what we're going to do about MARTA in the next two years, you will see some construction going on in the Stonecrest and South DeKalb area to create uh, those specific transit centers. As of right now in DeKalb County, we have 365 bus shelters. We have 3,411 bus stops and 56 new shelters will be done in 2020. I can also share with you, if you like, after the meeting, the locations. What we've done is to make sure that if I pass a, a bus stop and I see a mother standing there with a the child in the rain, that bothers me if she doesn't have a shelter. So I'm consistently going back and looking at all of the shelter locations to make sure that there's overhead shelter where the buses stop. That's part of it. Uh, I'm trying to talk in a hurry so I don't hold you up too long. But I'm excited about the transit center that will be at Stonecrest Mall and South DeKalb Mall. Because as I said to Marta, what has happened is a lot of our members, uh, residents, as you can see, have aged in the place. And because they've aged in the place, a lot of things that I've heard is that I don't want to have to drive to a doctor's appointment or it, the traffic in the morning is too much. So I wanna find a way, and there is no, especially not just Stonecrest, but in the South DeKalb area, there is no bus beyond 285. So there was no way for anyone to get to a, a transit location other than take an Uber or a Lyft, which didn't exist way back when. So what we've done is to say, we wanna see something created in these areas if it's not a train, we're looking at uh, BRT, which is bus rapid transit. We want to look at creating a specific lane for buses only going down I-20 so that if you want to park and ride, you'll have a way to avoid traffic by having a designated lane for buses only. So we're working really hard to make sure. We're also looking to develop with MARTA and the city uh, what we call TOD, Transit Oriented Development so that when we have people investing in our community, I want to make sure that there is an opportunity for our seniors to have a place to live, that they can have housing, that they will create X amount. In Atlanta, one thing they've done is some of the housing areas that have been developed around transit is they put maybe 70 to 50 to 70 apartments that they've designated specifically for seniors. So we wanna make sure that our seniors in our area are taken care of, that they have access to public housing as well as access to public transportation. So those are some of the things that I'm working on within MARTA and I'm available. We got to bring cards in, but I do have them. <laughs> They're in a purse in the car, but I am there and I have lots of answers for all of your questions and anything you wanna know regarding what we expect to do in this area and regarding MARTA in 2020, just stop by and I'll be glad to answer your question. Unless you have something right now pressing. No? All right, great, thank you. I like how you threw me under the bus with that last minute request comment. <laughs> She's family, by the way. So <laughs> I get to shoot a text message every now and then and say, come do this for me, please. Um, that's the only reason why. Um, so last but not least, Councilman Turner, if you will come up, please. Um, Councilman George Turner volunteered all of his free time uh, to head up our, <laughs> our uh, complete count census team here in the city of Stonecrest in partnership with DeKalb County. Um, so I'm going to let him talk a little bit about what we're doing, what our plans are, and how you can help get involved um, in making sure that we get the word out about census, and then we will depart for the evening. So before he starts, if there's anything left of refreshments you want to take with you, please, because you see that little guy sitting in the middle here somewhere and with a phone in his hand, he's going to want the cookies that are left over. So if you'll please take them with you, <laughs> he won't have to take them with him. Okay, thank you, George. Thank you, and good evening. 
Uh, let me just quickly say that the things that have been covered here in District 3 are the same things we talk about in District 4 and will probably be the same thing we talk about in District 5, 1, and 2. So um, the issues, well, just to say, we feel your pain. We do. And we've got to make sure that something happens along that line. And uh, Councilwoman Cobble, I thank you very much for putting together the slide. I don't know where you find my photograph, but it looks good. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, I had more hair than that. <laughs> anyway, um, usually I have a 20-minute presentation, and sometimes I cut it down to two minutes. But because we are getting so short in terms of the census um, being rolled out, we really, really, really need to pay attention to what's going on. Let me just draw a picture for you, the one that I drew for some uh, high school kids when I was talking to them about how important it is. Let's just say that there are a hundred of you in this room, that's what I said to them. And of that hundred, each one of you pays taxes. Let's say you pay a dollar to cover your lunch. But when someone comes by to ask how many people are here ordered lunch, and only 75 raised their hand, guess how many lunches you're going to get? You're going to get 75. And that might be okay for one day. You can put up with that. You pay for 100, but you're only getting 75. And that's what's happening with the census. We pay for a certain amount of people who live in Stonecrest. But we only get a certain percentage because only a certain percentage pays, well, will sign up for the census and are really counted. So getting 75% of your lunches, one day you might be okay. But that's go, that, would, that would be for 10 solid years before you can fix it. The same thing happened with the funding for your schools. You're only getting 72% of what you should be getting because only 72% of the people who pay taxes, send money to Washington, and the money comes back to the state, to the county, and to the school system. But you only get what the census says you have. And if the census says you only have 72% of what you know you have, you're stuck for the next 10 years. And that's what's going to happen to us again if we wind up getting undercounted. Now, that impacts what you talked about this evening. Players, where does that uh, LMIG money come from? The LMIG money for paving your roads and your sidewalks come from the state based on your census population. You could get or could have gotten 27% more money if we had had a 100% count. Now, we just touched on that one spot. There are over 50 different elements that are impacted by you getting the census correct. Hospitals, roads, schools, and it goes on and on and on and on. Political representation, nursing homes, daycare centers, 50 or more. And you, almost everything that's supported by uh, grant funding or federal funding is impacted by your getting that census count correct. Now, let me just rush on and tell you that how you can get it done, how easy it is. You'll get a card in the mail, a postcard, uh, starting in the middle of March, I think about March 12, it's on there. When the postcard comes in, you can go online, answer nine questions. Some say 10 questions, but it really is only nine. They're asking you your name. Uh, they really ask you your date of birth as well. They don't ask for any social security number, any maiden name of your mother or any of that stuff, identification stuff. They don't want to know what's your race, how many people live in the house, um, and what else. That's, that's about it. Those are some of the most key questions. It's not that much personal information. Believe you me, there's nothing on that census report that they don't already have on you. That's not, that's not on Facebook already. They just want to know how many people live in the house, what's your address, or they ask you your race. And there's one specific for the Hispanic community, which Hispanic um, heritage are you from. Other than that, that's all they're asking. And you do the same thing for every person who lives 
in that house. Now, for the city of Stonecrest, they've identified some hard-to-count areas. I have little doubt that you guys are going to participate, but you've got to reach your friends, your neighbors, folks at church, wherever you can reach them and make sure they participate. We work with New Birth uh, Church, and we're trying to work with all 54 churches in the city of Stonecrest. And New Birth has volunteered to become a census center. If you don't have access to a computer, you can go there and uh, fill out the census. You could, no, uh, that's the preferred way. You can also call it in. That card would have a number on it. You just use your card, phone it in, answer a few questions, and you're done. Or you can wait for someone to knock on your door, and you can answer those questions then. Now, there are a few census sites around town where you can go in and actually get a form and fill it out. But they might be a little bit difficult to get to, but still, that's another option. Internet, telephone, or someone will knock on your door. In the past, they've knocked 10 times if they couldn't get you. This uh, time around, they're only going to knock twice. So folks, answer when they knock. It means funding for uh, so many things in your community, almost everything in our community, in terms of a place for our kids to go play, uh, the parks, and it just goes on and on and on and on. So it is critical, critical, critical that you get people to participate. And I, I, I'm going to stop and ask you one question. Tell me why you would not participate. Give me one reason. I've heard some crazy reasons for not participating. So we're just trying to get those sample reasons so we can dispel the myth. It's all based on myth. And there were some times that we used to try to stick it to the man by not participating. But guess what? We are the man. All right? We have got to participate. Yes, ma'am. In order to become a census worker, you have to go to the federal government, and you have to uh, pass a background check and get uh, hired and certified to participate, and they will wear a badge. They must wear that badge. Now, uh, this is what you call a complete count census. The census does all kinds of statistical uh, surveys all year long. So some folks think they've already taken it. But this is the one that really counts in terms of knowing how many people live in this country. And we're concerned about how many people live in DeKalb County, and more specifically, how many live in Stonecrest, such that we will get 100% of what we deserve for the next 10 years. And folks, that's a lot of money. Uh, what's, the, what's the figure that's uh, on the board there? $2,341 per person, 10 years. And, yeah, and, and, and you add it up, that's $131 million in federal funding just coming to Stonecrest. We're not talking about the cab. The cab is closer to a billion. Any other question? Uh, this is a federal uh, mandate. Uh, it's a, a federal law that went into effect, I think, when George Washington was president that every 10 years, they would count every head in this country. Yes, it's federal. It's done at the same time. They will start mid-March with giving you your cards. Technically, census day is April 1, April Fool's Day. Don't be fooled by it. Please participate, April 1. And they will give you, I think, until sometime in July to get it all back in. Uh, if you don't respond to the first questionnaire, uh, they'll send you another one. Or the first postcard, they'll send you another one. And they may well send you a third one. And after they calculate how many people responded or didn't respond, then they will put together a list and start knocking on doors. And they'll do their best to get everybody counted. But guess who's often undercounted? Particularly black males and kids under five. I don't understand why that is, but... Children under five, and you think about it, if they get undercounted 10 years from now, they'll be 15 years old. They'll be in high school. And a lot of the resources 
that they are, are going to need, they won't be able to get. That's why you got so many trailers sitting in back of your schools now. You didn't get what you deserve. That's why the kids have no recreation centers. You didn't get what you deserve. Part of the, part of the reason you have uh, poor, poorly paved streets is that you didn't get all of what you deserve. So it can go on and on. I know you want me to shut up, but, uh, but uh, it's getting close now, and we can't cut it short. So what I want you to do, become ambassadors. Talk to everybody you run into. And if anyone says something negative about the census, you set them straight. These cards are here. Are they in the back? Okay. Please get one on it. You'll find our website. We keep updating it as to what's going on with the census. This is from the city of Stonecrest. There's one here from the city of, or from the county of the Cab. They're saying essentially the same thing. They give you a quick snapshot of what it takes to make it happen. And if you have any questions, uh, go to the website, and uh, you can get my telephone number if you need it. And give me a call. And if you want to volunteer, if you want a yard sign, let me know. Okay? Um, because we have a lot of communities um, in District 3 apartment um, complexes and condominium um, communities that it's a little harder um, to get to, especially um, uh, their mailboxes are kind of all in one central location, and it's a little different than a traditional home. So we want to make sure we're, we're, as our committee continues to meet and trying to figure out best ways that we can, as, a, as District 3, get together and try to infiltrate some of those more difficult areas to get to and educate. And actually, Ms. Iris has volunteered to, to help us as well. We're going to push a lot of these cards and communications out at Farrington Elementary and at Bowie Elementary. So as the parents are picking up the children after school, we'll be out there handing out and, and giving out push cards and information um, as well. So feel free to contact us if you want to join that, that, um, that parade with us so we can really make sure we're, we're getting the word out to everyone. So thank you, Councilman Turner. We appreciate it. That wraps up our meeting for this evening. Um, I really, really appreciate everybody coming out. Um, Councilwoman Grimes, if you'll come up um, and just say hi to everyone. <laughs> uh, if you don't know, this is Councilwoman Tammy Grimes, one of our newest council members for District 5. Um, and we're, we're happy to have her on our team. Thank you, Councilwoman. We, we appreciate that, and we will um, keep his family in our prayers. Um, thank you again for everyone coming out. Um, we actually, uh, one last comment, and then please take anything that is left on that back table. Okay, please. <laughs> but also, um, Ms. Rita Scott has a few um, MARTA cards uh, that she'd like to give out. So if you know of anyone or yourself, ride MARTA. She's got a few of those um, single ride cards or uh, well, full, uh, full ride card. Um, that you'd like to give out. Uh, trip. trip. There we are. I couldn't think of it. There we go. All right. Got a couple. It's a good last minute call, right? <laughs> Again, thank you so much. Uh, here's my contact information. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, send me an email, text message, whatever, whatever communication tool is easiest for you. Please reach out to us. All comments, recommendations, anything that we can we can gather to make everything um, in our city work in tandem. We're, we're looking forward to that. Thank you again. Have a great evening. Get home safe. Appreciate everything you do for Stonecrest. <laughs>